Well, we now come to the preaching of God's word, and so I invite you to take your copy of God's word and open to Romans chapter 8. And as you do that, note the infallible evidence that you have been justified and will be glorified is the presence of the Spirit in your life. In fact, the absence of his presence signals that you don't belong to Christ. In the language of Romans 8, 9, however, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. And then Paul says, but if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. The distinguishing mark that a person belongs to Christ is that they have the spirit. And so how do you know that you have the spirit? by virtue of possessing certain distinguishing marks that are infallibly present in the life of every true believer such that without them, you can make no claim on salvation. And in verses 12 to 17, three of these marks are underscored and call for a thorough and honest evaluation of our lives to ensure that they are undeniably present to vindicate the integrity of our profession of faith. You see, it's possible to be under the preaching of God's word, to be a member of a local church, to be baptized and to even serve and yet be as spiritually lifeless as the dark world around us and to be in that condition for years. In fact, even... Jesus himself says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Chilling words. And so we need to ensure that we've truly come to Christ as evidenced in the presence and activity of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Let's go ahead and read this passage. Romans 8, verses 12 to 17. Paul writes, So then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of slavery, leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons, by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children... Heirs also, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. So what did we see last time? We saw the reasons why the law is fulfilled in those who walk according to the Spirit. And we saw four of them. That through the Spirit, we've received the mindset of the Spirit a dispositional orientation of our mind, affections, and will, whereby we've been sovereignly set on the things of the Spirit. That through the Spirit, our nature has been transformed, ending our rebellion, making us willing, and overcoming our inability. That through the Spirit, we have access to the spiritual power we need to live the Christian life, the very power that rose Jesus from the dead. And that through the Spirit... The resurrection of our body is divinely guaranteed, being attested to by the fact that we've been raised to walk in newness of life. And truth be known, each of those are also distinguishing marks of the Spirit's presence, evidence that we have the Spirit and are internally and eternally indwelt by the Spirit. And that most certainly includes a life pattern after obedience to the Word of God. And though Paul is persuaded 
that the broader majority of his readers belong among the called of Jesus Christ, Romans 6, 1, 6, he nevertheless recognizes that some don't. And so he employs a number of conditional statements to distinguish between the saved and the unsaved. That the saved would recognize their true status and that the unsaved would recognize theirs and then heed the call of the gospel. And we've already identified the first one in the middle of verse 9, where again it says, but if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. The indwelling spirit is infallible evidence that you are saved. And Paul gives three other conditional statements to tease out the evidence that a person is indwelt by the spirit. And he gives two in verse 13 alone. It says there, for if you are living according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And that means that the mortification of sin is one of the distinguishing marks that you possess the Spirit. And the third comes in verse 17, where again it says, And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. Suffering with Christ is a mark that we're fellow heirs with Christ and that we therefore have the Spirit. And there's a, a third condition that we have the Spirit that's more implicit than explicit. And it comes out in verse 16, where it says, The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And that means that one of the dis distinguishing marks that we have the Spirit is that the Spirit testifies with our spirit that we've been adopted into God's family. And so in this passage... We're going to see three distinguishing marks that you have the Spirit and belong to Christ. Three distinguishing marks that you have the Spirit and belong to Christ. And the first is this, the mortification of sin. The mortification of sin. Look at verse 12. Paul writes, so then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. So why does Paul say this? He says it on account of what he's been saying, that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, that the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and of death, that we have the mindset of the spirit, that we are in the spirit, and that the Spirit dwells within us. And so it's on account of that that we have no obligation to the flesh. And that signals that we have been set free from the flesh and are no, and are no longer under its power, tyranny, and dominion. We have been released from slavery to the flesh. And consider the implications of what Paul is saying here. Because the, the fact that Paul says that we aren't under obligation to the flesh implies certain things about our present condition. That we haven't yet been delivered from the presence of the flesh. That we aren't immune to the influence of the flesh. And that therefore we remain capable of yielding to the flesh. And that's consistent with the ongoing internal war, the very war depicted in Galatians 5.17 between the flesh and the spirit within us. But as Galatians 5 indicates, it's the spirit who wins out. And so for the true believer, yielding to the flesh is the exception, not the rule. The overarching pattern of the believer's life is in the direction of of the Spirit. Four, verse 13, if you are living according to the flesh, you will die. And this would be better rendered, you will die. And will die an eternal death, paying eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his power. And so this is saying 
that everyone who lives according to the flesh will die in their sins and enter into everlasting judgment. So why is that? Why is that the outcome of living this way? Because it signals that a person remains under condemnation, that they're still enslaved to the law of sin and of death, that they remain hostile toward God, that they're both unable and unwilling to submit to God, that they're still in the flesh, and that they therefore walk according to the flesh. And so to live according to the flesh is to live in such a way that's consistent with enslavement to sin, and the wages of sin is what? Death, Romans 6, 23. But, rest of verse 13, If by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live and will live eternally in resurrected, glorified human bodies in the manifest presence of God and entirely delivered from the presence of the sinful flesh. And what's absolutely critical is that eternal life isn't secured by putting to death the deeds of the body. Instead, putting to death the deeds of the body is a distinguishing mark of someone who already possesses eternal life. And that's because it is utterly impossible to put sin to death apart from the Spirit of God. And so the mortification of sin is infallible evidence that you are in the Spirit, that you have the mindset of the Spirit, and that you are eternally indwelt by the Spirit. And that's because the Spirit is the means by which sin is mortified. Mortification of sin necessitates the Spirit's power. And it's intriguing that Paul refers to sin here as the deeds of the body. Why does he do that? We would expect him to say the deeds of the flesh. Well, as one source puts it, he means, quote, the deeds worked out through the body under the influence of the flesh, unquote. And that's because the deeds of the flesh are brought to concrete expression through the physical body. And so verse 13 promises that if we're actively putting to death the deeds of the body by the power of the Spirit, we have infallible evidence that we're saved. And that means, again, that one of the distinguishing marks that you have the Spirit is the mortification of sin. That sin is being put to death in your life actively, progressively, and efficaciously, such that your progress is undeniably evident both to yourself and to those around you. So let's think on this for a minute. What is it to put sin to death? Well, let's identify what it's not. It isn't making accommodations for sin, whereby instead of killing sin, you actually make provisions for sin, establishing avenues whereby you can secretly or quote-unquote respectably indulge in sin. Nor is it to make peace with sin, to simply accept the fact that so long as you're in this body, that sin is inevitable, whereby you are somehow going to just choose to coexist with sin. But also, it isn't merely to bruise or wound or injure sin, merely treating it as an opponent that you must somehow bring to submission without actually killing sin. Instead, to put sin to death is to do just that. It is to kill it, to cut it off from its very life source, from that which feeds it. 
It's to act in such a way that sin is progressively dying a decisive death in your life. That its very life is being suffocated out of it. It's to treat sin like weeds in your life, whereby you are actively doing whatever it takes to remove those weeds. And what's significant here is that Paul doesn't spell out how to mortify sin. There's no step-by-step process on the the how-to in this. And that's probably for two reasons. One, because he's marking out the mortification of sin as evidence of having the Spirit. And two, because it's the Spirit who is the one that actively leads us in this endeavor, even equipping us for this task. There's something intuitive about putting to death the deeds of the body if you have the Spirit. And yet I think we do well to rehearse a number of the imperatives that call us to this task. Romans 6.12, Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. So we aren't to obey sin. Romans 6, 13. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. And so we are to consecrate ourselves unto God. Romans 12, 1. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And so we are to offer our lives to God as a sacrifice, a living and holy sacrifice. Romans 12, 2, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. And so we are to be transformed by the renewing of our minds, a renewing that takes place by means of the word of God. And how about Romans 13, 14? But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. So not only are we to put Christ on, we are also called to not make provision for the flesh. And the idea is this, that you would give yourself to whatever is necessary to fulfill those commands, seeking to equip yourself by means of the work of the Spirit within you for the mortification of sin. And so it's time to enter into an honest and thorough evaluation of your life. The mortification of sin is a distinguishing mark that you have the Spirit. And so survey your life since conversion. Is the Spirit's presence practically evident in your life? Can you see that he's working? Can you see that he's molding and conforming? Are you seeing sin in your life be progressively put to death? Is there progress? Have you made progress since coming to Christ where you can definitively see that sin is dying and being killed? Is the entire trajectory of your life ordered around the mortification of sin? Is this either at the top or near the top of your list in terms of the aims and pursuits of your life? Is your vital need for the word, prayer, and the body of Christ undeniable to you? Do you absolutely need these things in your life to live the Christian life such that if you were to remove yourself from them, you would be in a a place of spiritual despair? 
Are these things critical? Jesus says, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Do you, do you have that experience? Can you testify to that, that you need the word of God that deeply? Do you truly hunger and thirst for righteousness? There's no question that hunger and that thirst is going to vary in degree, but nevertheless, it should be there, a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. Do you truly despise the things of this world, the things of this world system, the, the lust of the eyes, the, the lust of the flesh, the boastful pride of life? Do you truly despise those things? When you get off track, do you experience the discipline of the Lord where the Lord comes into your life and convicts you of your sin and, and convicts you of your, your, your way and, 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 and shies you, disciplines you lovingly to bring you back to the path of righteousness? Does that happen in your life? Have you experienced that sorrow in your life? And is it yielding the peaceful fruit of righteousness in your life? Are you actually becoming more like Christ? That's the goal of your salvation. The goal is that you would be molded ever more into the image of Christ. Are you actually seeing that be a reality in your life? Can you see that you are, in fact, being molded ever more into the image of Christ? Are you walking in such a way that the law is fulfilled in you through the power of the Spirit? Are you fulfilling the righteous requirement of the law as the Spirit empowers you to walk in obedience to God? Is your mindset on the things of the Spirit? Is that the orientation of your life? Is your mind and affections and will clearly set on the things of the Spirit? Because if not... You are living according to the flesh, and you will die. And you will die eternally, entering into eternal, everlasting judgment. We're seeing three distinguishing marks that you have the Spirit and belong to Christ. And the first is the mortification of sin. The second is the testimony of sonship. The testimony of sonship. Look at verse 14. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. So what does it mean to be being led by the Spirit? Well, verse 14 is explanatory. You can see the four there. And it's explaining verse 13. And so... To be led by the Spirit is synonymous with being empowered by the Spirit to put to death the deeds of the body. So please don't miss this. Being led by the Spirit isn't being led by so-called subjective promptings of the Spirit. This is not referring to something mystical. Instead, it's referring to the mortification of sin. You know that you're being led by the Spirit if you're putting to death the deeds of the body. That's what this is saying. As one commentator aptly puts it, the leading of the Spirit does not refer to guidance for everyday decisions in determining the will of God. It refers to being, quote, controlled by or determined by or governed by the Spirit, unquote. Or as another commentator writes, it's to have the direction of one's life as a whole determined by the Spirit. And as you might, as you might expect, Paul makes a similar statement in Galatians 5. Galatians 5.18, where he says this, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. And to be under the law, as you know, is synonymous with being under the power of sin. And so, to be led by the Spirit is to be led into obedience. And even results in the generation of the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 22 and 23, chapter 5. 
And so the mortification of sin actually vindicates that we're sons of God. Again, verse 14, for all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God and does so in such a way that's entirely consistent with the exclusivity of verse 13, because the word rendered all here in verse 14 is literally as many as, and accents the the limited extent of this sonship so that only those who are being led by the Spirit are sons of God. And this leads Paul to our our glorious adoption in verse 15 where he writes, for you have not received the spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. And so being led by the spirit of holiness in the pursuit of holiness is evidence of our adoption. It's evidence that we've received the spirit of adoption, namely the Holy Spirit by which we address God as our Father. And it's often at this point that the Roman practice of adoption is appealed to, where adoption in that culture is a legal institution severing a child from their formal legal status and conferring on them all the rights and privileges that normally belong to a natural child. And as we'll see, that is most definitely present in this idea. But the concept of adoption precedes and transcends the Roman institution and actually originates with God's adoption of who? Israel. Look at chapter 9, verse 3 and following. Paul writes, For I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Verse 4, who are Israelites, to whom belongs the adoption as sons. And so the concept of sonship originates with Israel. And so as we consider our own adoption as sons, it's not that we become Israel or that we replace Israel. It's that we become participants in and beneficiaries of the covenant promises made to Israel, the Abrahamic, Davidic, and new covenants. And yet even more glorious than that is that our adoption is a direct result of our union with Christ, whereby Every right and privilege that rightly belongs to Christ is bestowed on us, such that in Christ, we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in him, Ephesians 1.3. In fact, aside from a similar passage to this in Galatians 4, the only other time this intimate fatherly expression of Abba appears in scripture is in the garden of Gethsemane when Jesus made that agonizing appeal to the father that the bitter cup of divine wrath might be removed from him only to hear absolute silence and to go on to drink that bitter cup in full on our behalf. And it's because of that and our adoption as sons that we now cry out to God in prayer, Abba, Father, without any fear of impending judgment, because Jesus stood in our stead and took upon himself the judgment we deserve. And so we need to see how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called children of God, 1 John 3, 1. This is the most privileged status you could ever have. This makes any earthly inheritance seem like nothing. In fact, it renders it nothing. And we can have confidence that we are children of God on account of the testimony of the Spirit. Verse 16, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And this is referring to the internal experiential witness of the Holy Spirit who testifies with our spirit that we are God's children imparting to us 
the confidence and conviction that we are sons and confirming for us that we've been adopted into God's family. And so note this, our status as sons isn't just evidenced by objective fact. It's also evidenced by our subjective experience. It's both established in doctrinal truth and is something that transcends human comprehension. Quoting that last commentator, quote, Paul stresses that our awareness of God as Father comes not from rational consideration, nor from external testimony alone, but from a truth deeply felt and intensely experienced, unquote. And then he writes this, if some Christians err in basing their assurance of salvation on feelings alone, many others err in basing it on facts and arguments alone. Indeed, what Paul says here calls into question whether one can have a genuine experience of God's spirit of adoption without its affecting the emotions, unquote. So have you received the spirit of adoption? Does he testify with your spirit that you are a child of God? Does he generate within you the comforting conviction that you belong to God? Can you lay claim to both the objective evidence and the subjective experience that you have in fact been adopted into God's family? And though this is a reality that ought to be present in our lives at all times, there may also be moments when it's more pronounced, when the Spirit's internal witness is more palpable to you, when you're under the preached word, when you come before God in prayer, when you worship him in song, when in fellowship with God's people, these are times when the Spirit is going to be more active in testifying to us that we are, in fact, sons of God. And remember, this reality of the Spirit witnessing to us ties back to Romans 5.5, 5, where it says, And hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. And so there should be a an internal, experiential, and even incomprehensible sense of God's love for you as testified to by the Spirit of God. Do you have that? Do you see how great a love the Father has for you? Can you be confident that you have received this status of being a child of God? Because if not, is it not time to address that? Is it not time to deal with that head on? To be honest with both yourself and others? Yes, entering into that notion and entertaining that notion can be a terrifying thing to do, but it is far more terrifying to fall into the hands of the living God and to fall into his hands without the Lord Jesus Christ and without the Spirit. And so do you have the inner witness of the Spirit? Because if the Spirit doesn't testify with your spirit that you are a child of God, then you don't have the Spirit. we're seeing three distinguishing marks that you have the Spirit and belong to Christ. The first was the mortification of sin. The second was the testimony of sonship. Now, the third, the willingness to suffer. The willingness to suffer. Verse 17, and if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. So we aren't just children, we're heirs, and not just heirs, heirs of God. 
And we're heirs of God in two senses. For one, we are heirs of God himself. The supreme gift promised to Abraham is that God would be God to both him and his seed. Galatians 17, 7, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant. Here it is, to be God to you and to your descendants after you. So the supremely unrivaled aspect of our future inheritance is God himself. To have him, to be with him, and to behold him eternally. And for two, we're also heirs of all that God has promised. Which is inseparable from the reality that we are fellow heirs with Christ. Why is that so significant? Because Christ is the supreme seed of Abraham and heir of all that's been promised to him. And since we're in Christ, we too are heirs of the Abrahamic promise. Paul makes this point in Galatians. 3.29, and if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to promise. And that makes us heirs of the world. You say, really? Yeah. Look at Romans 4.13. It says, for the promise to Abraham or to his descendants that he would be heir of the world was not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. As fellow heirs with Christ, we are heirs of the created world. In fact, what does Jesus say in Matthew 5, 5? He says, blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit what? The earth. And what's amazing about this reality is that Paul actually takes up this very discussion in the next paragraph. Looking ahead to that time when, verse 21, the creation itself will also be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. And so at the second coming of Christ, the earth will be delivered from under the curse and will undergo a restoration that will rival Eden and bound up in our inheritance is coming to possess that future restored earth. But notice the rest of verse 17. Paul says, if, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may be, we may also be glorified with him. So suffering is a characteristic of a person who has the Spirit. But this is not talking about suffering in general. It's talking about suffering with Christ. It says there, if indeed we suffer with him. You say, is suffering really? Suffering with Christ really? Evidence that we have the Spirit? Yes. 1 Peter 4.14 If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. So future glorification isn't secured by suffering for Christ. No, instead, suffering for Christ is evidence that we have a share in future glorification. It's evidence the spirit rests on us. In fact, Jesus says in Luke 9, 26, for whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. You say, well, how does suffering prove I'm saved? Because it proves that you aren't of the world. 
and that you belong to Christ, John 15, 19. So long as you aren't suffering as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or a troublesome meddler, 1 Peter 4, 15. But if you are living a godly life, persecution is not just inevitable, it is a divine promise. 2 Timothy 3.12, indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. It's a guarantee. But as Paul will say in verse 18, it is not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And so one of the distinguishing marks that you have the spirit and belong to Christ is that you suffer for his name's sake. And so have you suffered for Christ? Are you suffering for Christ? Do you let your light shine before men? Do you live godly in Christ Jesus before a watching world? Do you stand up tall for the Lord Jesus Christ? Is that the directional pattern of your life? Or do you shrink back from suffering? Always taking the path of least resistance. Always avoiding necessary confrontation. Never taking a stand for righteousness. Where shrinking back is the pattern of your life. And if it's simply a matter of opportunity where in your stage of life you haven't yet been given the occasion to suffer for Christ, can you at least say that you are undeniably willing to suffer for him? Because the word of God says that suffering with Christ in the most truest and biblical sense is infallible proof that you have the spirit and belong to Christ. In fact, the refusal to suffer with Christ is evidence that you don't have the Spirit and that you aren't a child of God. So this too is life in the Spirit. And these distinguishing marks are a package deal. It's not like you can do this a la carte, pick one or the other. No, this is a package deal. To have one is to have all. The mortification of sin the testimony of sonship, and the willingness to suffer, infallible proof that you have the Spirit and that you belong to Christ. So what if you fail the test? What do you do? Well, you got to come clean. You got to come clean with God, and you got to come clean with others. You're going to have to be honest about your true condition. The charade's got to come to an end. You've got to be done with the hypocrisy, the, the playing of the part. And you have to come before God in honesty and confession and, and, and heed the call of the gospel, confessing Jesus as Lord and, and submitting the entirety of your life to him, being willing to Really, lay it all aside to have the Lord Jesus Christ and coming to him for forgiveness and cleansing and mercy. And so I would urge you, if you are there, as terrifying as it may be, deal with it now, because it's only going to be more terrifying later. And what if you have a spouse who you suspect isn't saved? What do you do then? Well, first you give glory to God with a heart full of thanksgiving that you are saved. You give him honor, glory, and praise for his mercy and grace in your life, and you, you rejoice before him. You exult in him. But you also do this. You ensure that you are not overcome by a root of bitterness. Because if you are, 
that root of bitterness that has your eyes on your spouse, who you suspect is not saved, may just be your own spiritual ruin and prove that what you think is true of them is actually true of you. And so if you are in a marriage and you suspect your spouse is not saved, just give glory to God for your salvation and be patient and pray for his or hers and, and, and let no root of bitterness spring up within you and defile you. Here's the beauty of this. If the mortification of sin is a reality in your life, if the testimony of sonship is a reality in your life, and if you are willing to suffer for the Lord Jesus Christ, then you have infallible evidence that you are a child of God, and not just a child, an heir, and not just an heir, an heir of God and a fellow heir with Christ, and you have the guarantee and future hope of eternal life in heaven, in the new heavens and new earth, in glorified human flesh, where you will be free, entirely delivered from the presence of sin, delivered from the sinful flesh, and able to see, behold, and worship God for all of eternity as we even work in that new heavens and new earth to the glory of God. If these marks are yours, then you are his forever. Amen? Let's pray together. Well, Father, we, we recognize that there are times when we come to your word that we are brought to a place of sober evaluation, a healthy place of introspection to ensure that we are truly in Christ that we have your spirit, that our eternal destiny is secure. And so, Father, we need you to help us with this. We, we need you to assist us in this. For those who truly are in Christ, Father God, testify in their hearts by your spirit that they are sons, truly adopted. And Father God, for those who aren't, Make it clear and evident to them and give them the courage to come clean with both you and others. And may it be a glorious case of reconciliation as they finally heed the call of the gospel. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.